So welcome to the American Library in Paris. Who's here for the first time? Curious? Okay, welcome, welcome. I'm Alice McCrum. I'm the programs manager here at the library. And um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second in-person conversation of Entre Nous, which is an interdisciplinary series created by the American Library in Paris, Columbia Global Centers Paris, and the Institute for Ideas and Imagination. Uh, the series features dialogues between scholars, journalists, and artists from around the world. Tonight, I have the great pleasure to present Lauren Elkin and Lauren Collins to discuss Lauren Elkin's new book, number 9192, A Diary of a Year on the Bus. Two quick reminders before we start. Uh, towards the end of tonight's conversation, about 40 minutes in, we'll be opening up the discussion to your questions and comments. So whether you are in person, we also have about 45 people on Zoom, hello. Welcome as well. Uh, we can also ask your questions and comments as well. So don't hesitate anyone to please go ahead and submit them. Uh, and then the second reminder is at the end of tonight's conversation, you'll be able to buy copies of Lauren's book and she'll be signing them. So again, don't hesitate to go out and buy them. So now I will introduce tonight's speakers and they will go ahead and have their conversation. Lauren Elkin's writing on books, art, and culture have appeared in a variety of international publications, including the London Review of Books, the New York Times, and Le Monde, among many others. A scholar of literature, Elkin has taught at NYU, the American University of Paris, right next door, the University of Liverpool, and the Université de Paris, Denis Diderot. Elkin's last book, Flanners, Women Walk the City, was a finalist for the pen Award for the Art of the Essay and a New York Times Notable Book of 2017 and a Radio 4 Book of the Week, BBC Radio 4. Lauren Collins, so Lauren will be in conversation with Lauren. <laughs> Two Laurens. Lauren Collins began contributing to the New York in 2003 and became a staff writer in 2008. She is the author of One in French, Love in a Second Language, which the Times named as one of its 100 Notable Books of 2016. And she is currently working on a second book about a coup d'etat um, perpetuated by white supremacists in North Carolina in 1898 and its effects on the city during the last uh, past 120 years. Lauren Elkin, Lauren Collins, thank you so much for being with us at the library this evening. Can we have a round of applause? Thank you. Alice, thank you so much for the introduction. I pressed the right button, right? All good. Um, thank you to the library for having us. Um, thank you, Lauren, for um, inviting me to speak with you tonight, and thank you all so much for joining us for our Lauren Palooza tonight. Um, Lauren, this is what they call in the trade a slight volume, meaning it's not a long book, um, but it is full of enormous ideas. You wrote the entire thing on buses, the 91 and the 92 to be exact. Um, Amazing on Virginia Woolf and Georges Perrec, uh, rating people's outfits, recording your early thoughts about two events that rocked you to the core, a miscarriage and the terrorist attacks of 2015. If I can quote from the jacket copy, your diary, here's the quote, queries the lines between togetherness and being apart, between the everyday and the eventful as you register the ordinary makings of the city and its people. It's a wonderful, ever so slightly weird book, and I encourage all of you to read it, whether you're circulating in the city, whether you're circulating in the city in a plane, train, um, I guess not a plane, or automobile, or you're stationary at a cafe. Um, so let's start simple. How did you get here tonight? Um, I took the line 10 from Cardinal Le Moine, where I'm staying, to La Mode Piquet Grenelle, where I then walked for about 15 minutes past the Eiffel Tower and took a selfie, just like you. <laughs> I sent Lauren, we were both running a little bit late, and I sent Lauren a message and said, I'll be there in five, I'm being super basic on the way here, and it was like me and the Eiffel Tower glittering in the background, and she responded immediately with a video <laughs> that she had taken of the Eiffel Tower. Um, anyway... Did you take any notes while you were here? I did. Well, I was in my notes app. Um, I want you all just to get um, a sense, if you haven't read the book yet, of how brilliant um, this book is in its sort of elliptical nature and how Lauren was able to intermingle kind of the everyday um, with you know, the deepest thoughts that a person can have while taking notes um, on her iPhone on the bus. Will you read, um, will you read page 34? 
It's sure. just a passage, a passage I really liked that I think gives a good, a good taste um, of what you're going to get in the book. Okay. So thank you, Lauren, for agreeing to do this with me. And thank you, everyone, for coming and to the library for hosting us. It's amazing, amazing, amazing to be here. We moved to London um, in September. Well, we had been in Liverpool for a while, but actually it was a, an amazing homecoming for me to be in Paris for the first time in seven months. Um, and I'm going to try not to cry. So um, this is, as I have been directed to read, page 34. It's um, a year ago. Did we do that on purpose? Or not a year ago, but uh, I guess 2014, seven years ago. Did you do that on purpose? I, I want to say yes, but <laughs> no, I picked it. That's amazing. I didn't pick it at random. I picked right. it because I liked, liked it. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it just happens to be November 17th, 2014. This is also <laughs> a book about numerology. Yes, <laughs> seriously. So Monday morning, reading Species of Spaces. Why have I never noticed before how much Parekh likes the word parallelopiped? Every time I teach Parekh, I'm more convinced I need to teach an entire class on his work. The way he sees the world, his awareness of how difficult it is to really see it. What does it mean to see it when we can only see bits and pieces of it? When we go to new cities, we climb up to high places to try to see it all at once, to take it in as a whole. Parekh goes to his cafe and writes the city bit by bit, piece by piece. Someone on Facebook. I know this is annoyingly vague, but if any of you were planning to be mean to me this week, I'd appreciate it if you put it off a while. Too much bad news, sorrow, etc. This is a person who has only ever been a competitive backstabbing. I fight the impulse to use a misogynist slur. I board the 92. <laughs> Speaking of correct, you had another line that I loved. I think it was something like the Olympians are never are never so happy as when they're on the bus or something like that. Are you happy on the bus? Lauren, tell us about your relationship to buses and also your about your relationship to your phone and why you decided back in you started in 2014, right? Why you decided back in 2014 that you were going to chronicle the world um, from your seat on public transportation. What, how did the project occur? Um, so yeah, I'm not like more happy on buses than in other places, um, particularly, and certainly there's a difference between buses in Paris and buses elsewhere. You know, we, can, we can have a whole like anthropological study of, of the bus, you know, comparatively <laughs> to London and Paris, they're radically different, not to mention Liverpool. Um, but yeah, it happened because I, it was 2014, I think I just finished writing the draft of Lenin's. Um, so I had this kind of excess of observational energy. I was, you know, moving through the city and thinking about the way we move through cities. Um, and I sort of couldn't stop doing that. I couldn't relax and like stop observing. So I think I had just delivered and I'd, I'd been given the, the delivery portion of the advance. And with that influx of cash, I bought myself my first smartphone, iPhone, little yellow one. Um, and I started, you know, I started like doing the things on the smartphone that people do on smartphones, you know, with, with the apps and whatever. I got really into apps. Um, and yeah, I found this one particular day, I think pretty early in the semester in September 2014, I happened to notice that there is a sticker on the wall of the bus that said, your telephone is precious. It may be envy, please be vigilant, you know, basically warning you against pickpockets. And I was like, okay, I will use my phone to be vigilant, but I will use it to be vigilant about the world around me rather than losing myself in all these fun new apps. I'm going to use the notes app to write about what I see on the bus. And so it didn't begin as a book project or anything. It really just began as a way to like channel all this Flanders energy that I had knocking around. And so um, what were the sort of rules of engagement that you set for yourself as you were doing this? I mean, could you, um, I don't know how early you knew that there might be an audience for this someday when it went from diaristic um, to, and I think that makes a difference. I'm really curious to know when you realized that someone other than yourself might read this someday. But yeah, tell us a little bit about the parameters that you set for yourself. Was it all simultaneous observation? Could you edit later? Um, what, what did you know when about what you were writing? 
Um, yeah, it, it, so it was probably not until second semester uh, after the Shangri Hebdo attacks had happened. They, they happened in January, shortly before we went back for the second semester. And then in April, I think, or early May, I had this ectopic pregnancy. Um, and that kind of knocked my life sideways. And I stopped riding the bus because I stopped going to work. Um, and well, I, you know, I eventually went back to work, but I had like an Avai for a couple of weeks. Um, and then we moved from the fifth where we had been living, which is where you know I got the 91 bus from, um, to, and then changed at Montparnasse to get the 92, and then uh, not too far from here to go to AUP. Uh, we moved to Belleville, and then I was on the metro taking the line, um, I think it was the line 11 to the line eight, um, and back again. So yeah, I think it was much further on into um, that academic year that I started to think, God, I've been writing a lot of these notes on the bus. Maybe there's an arc to them now that something has happened instead of it just being, you know, Lauren's, Lauren's interesting thoughts, <laughs> Lauren's not so interesting thoughts. Um, so I didn't have any constraints at the time because it was just like, I was on the bus and I had some time so I would take some notes. But then the constraints that I set for myself came in later when I was, you know, taking them from my phone and putting them in a Word document. And the constraints were that I couldn't change anything. Um, like I couldn't edit them, I couldn't revise them, I couldn't make them into more than they were. The only thing that I would allow myself to change was like weird misspellings. Like just on the way here tonight on the Metro, I, I took a note and wanted to write from the inside. And then obviously I typed it wrong because it auto-corrected to from the window. So, you know, I changed things like from the window to from the inside so it would be clear what I was trying to say. Um, but yeah, that, that was about it. So what do you think this medium, which the and with its particular constraints on both kind of time and space, what did it do to your writing? Do you think, I mean, did it, do you think when you're thinking in iNotes, are you thinking differently than you are when you're thinking in word or when you're thinking in penmanship or when you're thinking just out in the great wide open? What, what, how did the medium affect um, what you produced and what you observed? That's a really good question. I think, I mean, for those of us who are on social media you, or, or just read, you know, lurk on social media, you probably notice that there's like a patois that people adopt. Um, there's fewer punctuation, fewer punctuation marks, like commas and things tend to not appear or there will be periods at the end of the thought. And it becomes part of the voice of the online speaker or the tweeter that you don't, you know, kind of drop something in and then don't punctuate it. Um, so I think as I was um, getting to know that voice, it was probably around the same time as I was discovering what it meant to have a smartphone and to be able to take notes like that on the fly. Um, previously, I'd written in Moleskine journals. And so, you know, there's something a lot less formal about um, writing on your phone because you don't have to like whip out a, <laughs> a, a black, like hard notebook, hard, hard backed notebook and like find a pen and write down what you wanted to write. You know, on the phone, you can write pretty fast. And I think what I was trying to say about Twitter or, or social media is that I think we're sort of in a space now where we're, um, conditioned to to maybe not write specifically in that patois I'm like a little bit too old to be writing in that patois you know unironically I don't know if anyone writes in it unironically but you know it doesn't come naturally to me um but it's definitely inflected my voice a little bit so you know some of the some of the um entries in here probably sound a little bit like tweets and it's probably because you know that kind of twitter speak had infiltrated my brain probably still has. It's funny because I remember um, there's one sort of vignette where you say something like, it's 8.30 in the morning and there's a woman crunking in a business suit and I really wanted to um, film her, but I didn't want her to see me or I don't know what, it was funny. That stuck out to me. Um, it, it just seven years later, it reads like a period piece for two reasons. I mean, I had forgot that crunking was it. I was like, wait, crunking. I had to Google it and make sure I remembered right dancing, a form of mid 2000s dancing. Um, and the second thing was just your reticence about filming her because now everyone is filmed all the time doing everything. Um, do you think if you were writing this book today, it 
would be different? I think yes and no, right? Because as as you say, you know, there there are certain things that we're noticing about the world um, that I don't know. I may be a bit uh, in order to now, like. I'm not sure. I think there are things that I was noticing about the city back then coming off of Flanders that might pass me by now because um, I'm no longer in that state of writing a book about a public space. Um, so I think I'm probably a little lazier um, as an observer. And at that time, I was a new adopter of social media like Instagram. Um, so I think I was actually looking for like things to Instagram back then. Whereas now I think I'm a bit, you know, more chill about it. I don't have to like share. Yeah, you just window. go for the Eiffel Tower shot <laughs> and call it a day. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, as as I personally have settled into to what it means to to like look at something and share it with the world, um, I've probably chilled out a little bit in terms of what I notice. Um, but that said, I think a lot of the notes that are on my iPhone that I've taken just today in transit. Um, are probably very similar in like tone and and quality as the ones that are in the book. Um, so, Perfect is one of your one of your influences in this book. Can you tell us a little bit about his concept of the infraordinary and how that um, influenced or um, prefigured what you were trying to do here? Yeah, definitely. So. Um, in an essay called Approaches to What from the 70s, I can't remember the exact year, maybe like 76, I want to say, um, Perec writes uh, that we we only really read in the newspapers about the extraordinary, like events that are, you know, shocking or surprising or, or newsworthy. And, you know, he's writing in the 70s, maybe this is different today. Uh, we don't hear so much about the infraordinary, what happens when nothing is happening. Um, and he is, encouraging readers in that essay to think about the infraordinary in terms of um, just the everyday things that we tend to take for granted and not query. Um, he says, question your teaspoons, what is under your wallpaper? Um, and I think that's a really potent message. I remember this same year teaching that essay to my students, and I think I'd taken an Uber to work that morning. Um, and that was back when Ubers used to give out bottles of water, you know, like single use plastic bottles. Um, and this is before I think the phrase single use plastic bottle was in, in circulation, maybe it was more specialized then. And so I, you know, I like turned to the bottle and I asked my students to think about where it had come from, the tarmac it might have sat on, the heat that might have been on it from the sun, um, and where is it going to go when I'm done with it? Does it really get recycled? Does it just go to China where they burn it? You know, what's What's, what's the journey of this plastic bottle? Question your plastic bottles to think about, you know, how the world is put together and how we process waste, et cetera. So, you know, that, that was a really important thing to say in the 70s. It's an important concept to come back to today. But for me, it was a question really of just looking at the people that you're seeing on the bus and, and the, the world that um, you're participating in or, or helping to construct when you are on the bus and are you, what are you making room for? What kind of um, ambiance of like consideration or generosity are you making or, or failing to make? Um, you know, I'm very quick to like, judge people for uh, encroaching on my space, but then a few times I catch myself encroaching on other people's space. And, you know, we're, we're all just out there doing our best, but um, I think that Perec is probably uh, a guiding light in terms of helping us to think about the way that our lives, you know, abut other people's and how we how we need to make room for them to, to live theirs, I guess, with more ease. You cite this kind of experiment or exercise that Breck once did where he attempted to um, exhaust a place. He sat in a place for some sort of piece for several days, I guess, tell me if I get this wrong, but, and attempted to kind of chronicle but was it all the buses that went by and whatever, maybe kind of whatever else he could see. Um, and considering this, you write um, about how tough it is to notice everything and how freeing it is to try. What is liberating about attuning yourself to the minutia of, of everyday life? That's such a good question. I mean, just as a, as a writer, 
you find yourself so often um, confronted, maybe not with the blank page, but like with the blank next step, like where does this go? Like what, how, how can I keep thinking through whatever I'm mulling over? And so whether I'm writing about, you know, public space or whatever, I don't know, artist I'm, I'm writing about right now in, in my book, I find it to be incredibly kind of um, calming maybe for the brain to, to contemplate something that I um, am just kind of witnessing or have no control over that's happening without me. I don't know. I find it really refreshing personally as a, as a person who spends their time thinking and writing to just like be noticing joggers or noticing cars or even to give it more structure than that, you know, notice the buses as they go by or notice all the people with paper bags um, or, or plastic bags, shopping bags. Um, but then just as a person in the world to spend your time kind of itemizing what you see. I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's a weird thing to find liberating, but it feels like, you know, I mean, this is probably to, to go to the opposite end of the spectrum, like people who are not in liberation, you look at like the, the tradition of the prison diary, like that is very much, you know, it's about contemplating great questions of power and, and freedom, but it's also about getting to grips with your environment and, and almost finding some kind of control over them by, by eliciting, eliciting them or enumerating them. Um, that was a really interesting answer. Thank you for that. Um, is there anything that is simply too boring to, <laughs> to pay attention to? If you have the inventory as the sort of opposite of the creating, creative writing exercise, um, and that, I mean, from what I understand, is a good way to maybe kind of get your intellectual juices flowing or to feel some kind of you know, freedom within constraint in a way that loosens you up and allows you just um, to have thoughts that are maybe difficult and cunning. But what, yeah, what were there things um, that you either saw over and over again on the bus and thought, I simply don't care, no matter, <laughs> no matter how much I'm trying to take um, the infraordinary um, seriously, or were there things that you wrote and then went back and thought, um, this just isn't cutting it? Like, how did you shape your material either as you were going or later? Um, I think Perec could probably say, no, there's nothing so boring to, as to not be worthy of our notice. Um, certainly not in the built environment and probably not in our homes either. I mean, he wrote an entire essay about how he organizes his books which, you know, maybe to a non-book person is like the most important thing they could think of. Just put them on the shelf, maybe alphabetize them. But um, for people who are super into books, it's like, oh, yeah, how are you, you going to do it? Um, there's a, a writer called Anne Gareta, who's also a member of the Blupo, who wrote a kind of response essay to his essay. And she suggested organizing your books around um, who, you know, books that were given to me by someone I once loved or books in which a whale appears, or books in which no whale appears. Um, so yeah, you could really just amuse yourself into, into, I don't know, oblivion with these things. But yeah, I mean, when I was, when I was doing the, these, these journal entries, I, I can't really tell you what I wasn't taking notice of because I wasn't taking notice of it. You know, it's, that's, that's what I think Perec's um, attempt at, leave, at exhausting the police in Paris teaches us is that you're, when you're busy paying attention to one thing, you're not noticing other things. So if I'm interested in a woman croaking, like there's definitely other people doing less um, spectacular things that were either in my blind spot or I could see them that I didn't care. So, you know, people getting on, people getting off, like you assume that's happening on the bus, whether or not you're paying attention to it, but it's certainly worthy of attention to pay attention to who gets on where and who gets off where. Um, I think, my, well, maybe not my favorite one, but the one that made me um, honestly laugh out loud was, I think you get on the bus and there's a guy who's taking up a little bit more space than maybe, than, you know, perhaps he ought to. And you're thinking, boy, man spreader, bouge ton cool. <laughs> Which was just like, so, I was like, it's Liverpool, it's New York, it's Paris. It was the most, um, perfect rendition of the idiosyncrasy of someone's inner monologue 
kind of where, where you know everything you've done in your life, all the places you've lived, all the languages you've studied, um, all the you know tweets you've written and read, and just everything converged in this one line that I felt like only you could have said, and I I loved it so much. Um, and so I think one of the things in the book that's like so effective is the way you move between your innermost, um, most personal, most private, most perhaps even unintelligible to anyone else um, thoughts and, and that flow of one's inner monologue. You move between that and then you move between this larger collective um, legible to anyone experience. Um, how did you negotiate those kind of two channels of your mind? <laughs> um, and how did you unite them in a way um, that they make sense, I guess? I think when you're someone who writes in the first person, that's something that you're always negotiating. Like, to what extent is what I'm writing um, interesting only to me and maybe to the people who know me? Um, and to what extent does it hook up with larger concerns for people who don't know me and really don't care you know, <laughs> what I was thinking about on the bus? Um, and I think, yeah, that's, that's like the question for, for writing in the first person, how there's no rule for it, but I do find myself sometimes reading the work of some people who I won't name and you see the way like contemplating a painting is just a way for them to think about themselves and their problems. And so in some people's work, it's like, oh, I just can't deal with you. And other people, it's like, oh, this is fascinating. I love hearing about how this makes you want to live in your mind. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know really what the magic is that makes that work sometimes and sometimes not. But I love something that Deborah Levy said once in a, some interview that I saw her do or podcast I listened to where she said like what, what keeps her interested when she's reading something and I take this very much to heart as a writer is that she's fascinated by the, the way the mind on the page is working. Like you never know what they're going to notice next. And so when I am revising work, I don't think this is necessarily the case in this book because it was a different kind of animal. But when I'm revising my work, I am attuned to um, the question of whether the, the turns that my mind is making or the rhetoric is making, if they're like really banal and like, you know, anyone could make them, or if, as you say, you know, I found something like boy, men's brother, who's more cute, <laughs> that only you can say. And, but, you know, that's not to say that, that like I'm necessarily so unique or any of us are so unique I mean I was just writing today about um motherhood uh towards the end of this book that I'm writing and I am recalling in the text that I came across this line by um Claudia Day who's a Canadian writer in the Paris Review a few years back and she wrote mothers are makers of death and when I read that I was like wait hang on didn't I write that I went back through like my whole hard drive, you know, I looked for it and then I looked at like published work and I was like, I know I didn't say that. I thought I said that, like I could have sworn I said that. And sometimes I, I think she's just like plugged into the great collective unconsciousness of, of mothers or maybe parents. Um, but yeah, I was just astounded that like someone could have articulated so well something that I could have, I thought I could have said myself but hadn't. And so I think when you're writing, you're really just trying to tune in somehow to that, to like something that just rings true, whether it's only something that you could say or something that any of us could have said because it's just so true. Um, there's this incredibly moving passage in the book where you position yourself, you take this kind of maternal stance toward Paris, the city that you live in. And this was written, it, it, it was written in November of 2015. Um, and you say something like Paris, or I wrote it down. Ah, uh, Paris, I want to make it all better. Smooth your rumpled pavement, kiss the hot forehead of Sacre Coeur. Um, can you talk a little bit about the way you grief over your ectopic pregnancy and the terrorist attacks intermingled um, and what you made of that as an artist, how that translated onto the page? Hmm, that's a, that's a tough one. 
Um, I think that this is probably true for a lot of writers that like often the writing comes from dramatic experiences, whether it's a breakup or a terrorist attack or your own you know, body turning against you in a way that <laughs> you are totally taken aback by. Um, and, and so, yeah, that just, for some reason that's very generative, which is not to say that you can't, that good writing can't come from like everyday life. Um, and I think that's probably like the big challenge of this book was finding a way to write both the everyday and the events, both the extraordinary and the intraordinary, and then kind of charting the way the event then seeps into the everyday and, and looking at how the quality of the everyday shifts or evolves or like some something about it. It takes on different colors or something. I don't know. It inflects your voice differently. Um, and then and then you can kind of you can see almost in the in the book where Charlie Hebdo is no longer on my mind. You know, it's not that it, that I'm not sad about it, but it's that I stopped worrying about it and focusing on it and, and shifted my attention elsewhere. Um, so yeah, I think that was that's probably like the big challenge of the book. It's interesting. I just realized that this kind of inventory taking that you had been doing, um, I saw that reflected in one of the lines of the book that really hit me hardest, which was. Um, in writing about the, the attacks, you said um, there are 17 fewer Parisians today. And that was like another form of counting um, that you were doing. And I, th I thought the way that you were able to apply that technique that you had honed, um, you know, just kind of cataloging banalities around you every day was a really, really powerful way to take on something that you know elicits such um oceanic emotions in people that it's often difficult to write in a way that feels specific or that feels um you know like like you have something to say that only you could say um tell us a little bit because we're gonna have to well we're not we will be thrilled to open the floor up to questions soon. But you mentioned the book that you're working on now, and I know that you have been working on it um, for a while. And I suspect that a number of people in this audience are eagerly awaiting it. Will you just will you say a few words about that too? Um, yeah, it's it's at that stage now where I've been working on it for so long that I almost don't know what it's about anymore. Um, let's, let's begin with the title. Uh, <laughs> it, it has one. <laughs> this is my title. I think yeah. this is a book that, as as far as I can tell, is very close to being written. So it's not too much of a low blow. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah, it's called Art Monsters, um, and On Beauty and Excess is the subtitle for now. And yeah, it it began as an attempt to query what Jenny Offill might have meant in her 2014 novel Department of Speculation where she says, um, I never meant to get married. I always wanted to be an art monster. Um, and she talks about how art monsters don't concern themselves with the minutiae of daily life, but rather um, leave that to the wife while they turn their attention to the great questions of art and truth and meaning. Um, and when I read that phrase in that novel, I was really struck by it. And she says it like it's a thing. Um, and I was like, okay, Google art monster. Um, and I didn't, I couldn't find anything. I found, you know, the French most further that, which I think come, probably comes closest to what she meant, but it's not like a phrase that, that people use. So I thought I would um, think about what that might mean, what monstrosity might mean for women writers and artists. Um, and I thought I was going to be writing about like motherhood and art, and I thought I was going to be writing about like monstrous women, and ended up not actually going down that path. It's, it's very much a book about um, an aesthetics of monstrosity that tries to restore, that looks at women's art that tries to restore touch to the aesthetic. So work that makes us react in some way or feel something and not necessarily only in the abject sense of being disgusted or revulsed, but that, I mean, that's part of it too, but it's, it's, it's about work that has a kind of texture um, or uckiness as uh, the artist Eva Hesse used to call it, um, you just kind of makes you go like this, work that makes you go like this. Um, so I write about Hessa and um, Kathy Acker and Wolf, um, Carly Schneeman, Hannah Wilkie. 
there's just a bunch, a bunch of writers, artists, a little bit of filmmakers, a little bit of dancer, choreographers. Um, and it all kind of spirals out of the 1970s and out of a 1931 essay that Wolf wrote called Professions for Women. So yeah, it's getting the structure right is what I've been working on and trying to figure out, you know, why, why is this book spiraling in and out and around of the 70s and also this 1931 essay? So yeah, it's, it's getting there, it's not quite there yet. Um, I can't wait to read it. With that, um, should we open up the floor to questions? Can we have a round of applause, please? <laughs> Does anyone have a question or a thought? Or a comment? Question or are, comment? are people on Zoom allowed to ask questions? Okay. People on Zoom. Hello, people on Zoom. <laughs> there are 78 people on Zoom. So, yes. Hi. First of all, I want to say thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I have a question about you, who actually, since you were talking so much about Jean Pierre. And my question is, since it did become, in, it started in France and obviously influenced you in the way that you write, I was just wondering whether you've thought about why did you started in France and whether there is an equivalent sort of school or an adaptation that you can see today in American writers, or do you think it's very purely franco-français and not so much of an international way of thinking about writing? Oh, I think it's had a lot of uptake around the world and, and you know, in the Anglo-American world, especially, I think, you know, the techniques of the ULIPO writing through constraint or something that's um, that are still taught in creative writing programs and um, definitely taught in academic settings. Um, I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking of anyone who's who I, who's like spoken about that, but I know it's something that's just kind of in the water. Um, and is it a, is it a franco français kind of movement? I think it is at the same time. I mean, it was founded in 1961 by a group of poet mathematicians. <laughs> and they, they were just really, really into math and really, really into poetry and seeing if there was some kind of something that could be done between the two. And I think of that as like, you know, if you, you compare like an English garden to a French garden, the English garden is going to be all wild and like, even if it's artificial, it will be artificially wild. Whereas the French garden is going to be, you know, they've like trimmed the hedges into submission. Um, <laughs> and they like, you know, order, it's just like Germanic side, since I'm speaking in, in massive generalization. Um, and yeah, so I think, you know, bringing, bringing mathematical order to poetry is like a very French thing to do. Um, but, you know, it came, it came out of the 60s and out of a real kind of movement and deep interest in the everyday. I mean, Perec specifically is, is reading a lot of Henri Lefebvre and Roland Barthes um, and Michel de Certeau eventually. And they're all kind of reading each other and talking to each other and, and have this kind of major moment where um, making sense of the minutiae of everyday life becomes a philosophical project and a literary project for in Perec's case. And then that itself, you know, has taken off to, to great um, effect in France. I mean, someone else who we haven't spoken about at all because I don't name check her in the book and I really feel bad about that now, um, but the kind of shadowy um, presence in this book is Annie Arnaud, who wrote a book called Journal du Bureau, which came out in 1993, which was basically this. I mean, that was that was the like her text for this book in addition to an attempted exhausting place in Paris. She wrote about her journeys to and from Statue Pontoise where she lives into Paris and wrote about the RER and the people she saw there, what they were reading, graffiti she passed on the walls and the tunnels and, and whatnot. Um, and then also writes about like the supermarket and supermarket parking lot is really trying to, she's really trying to find these spaces that we might otherwise take for granted as like non-meaningful spaces and invest them um, with meaning. And then she did it again in another collection and then another one after that. So there, there are three books that, that Anyono published that are like her diaries basically. But those, just to talk a little bit more about Annie Arnaud, because she's so wonderful, um, she calls them journaux extimes. So she's not, she makes a decision not to write about herself, but to write only about what she sees in the world. So my project was definitely more, you know, inward looking as well as outward looking. So I, I would make that distinction. But yeah, she's, and she's written about how much Perec has influenced her work and how important it is to her. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, throughout the book, uh, I noticed that a lot of the time there are questions about who got a seat on the bus and guilt about not signing up for people. And then later on, um, you know, when a woman's very obviously pregnant, finding that difficult because she gets to have the seat. Um, what, what your thoughts on the hierarchy of bus etiquette, community, um, and yeah, that sort of pregnant body coming in on the bus? Yeah, that, that pregnant body is, is a real question in this book. I mean, you know, because for, so for a lot of the second half, I'm pregnant, but it's the very early stages of the pregnancy, so nobody can see it. So, you know, that completely transforms my experience of, of public space. Um, and you can't even like ask for that to be acknowledged because you're not showing. Um, it's a really weird kind of shadowy time um, in a pregnancy when you can't really tell people and no one's getting up for you, but you arguably, you know, have a pretty good right to a seat on the bus because you're like, Whoa, the, like the movement. Um, and yeah, and, and so, you know, there ends up being this like, very invisible kind of hierarchy of needs that obviously extends beyond the pregnant body. And I do talk about how um, the 91 goes to a lot of hospitals, connects up a lot of hospitals um, on the left bank. And so a lot of people on the bus are going to be sick in ways that you can't necessarily see. So yeah, it's kind of a, a, a free for all. We have this hierarchy of like, give your seat up to elderly people, people who might have difficulty standing, pregnant women, women with children, you know, in, in London, there's like funny little graphics to describe, you know, kinds of people, the ghost in the machine, like that's, that's what troubles the whole, the way that our society operates. And so we're all just kind of on the bus performing, being, you know, respectful to old ladies, but then you also, you might feel shitty, but then you're like, I do have a reason to be sitting. I do, I wish I could tell people. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really tricky space. A man on the bus for children, that's the real wild card. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, we have a question on Zoom. So this is from uh, Marie Thieu. She says, I have a, a question for Lauren Elkin. Does your work as a translator have an influence on your work as a writer and vice versa? And if so, in what ways? Um, definitely, but <laughs> thank you for your, your question. Um, definitely, and, and not always, it's not always the same. Um, on, for each work. So this book, uh, you're in public space as a native, well, I, I was in public space as a native English speaker, as you know, someone who's learned French um, over the course of my life. And you're kind of constantly navigating between the two languages, between um, you know, my written language of English and the language that's all around you of French. And there's a moment in the book where I stop to think about how there are certain French sounds that you have to learn to hear as vulgar. So like the word that you're last, sorry if I'm being vulgar in public. Um, I remember using it in front of um, a child, like a little little niece of an ex-boyfriend of mine. And like, she did something gross. And, and I was like, oh, c'est ça. And he was like, oh, no, no, no. We don't, we don't say this word to a child, it's a very vulgar word. And I just didn't know, you know, you have to learn to hear like last as like a, a slang or, or vulgarity. And so, you know, I'm, I was still then and I'm still now translating myself into French um, to, to do this kind of performance of the language where you don't make mistakes like that. Um, so it's, you know, as any translator will tell you, very difficult to translate from your native language into the foreign language, most people work the other way around. Um, I definitely work the other way around. Um, so I think that's 10 rather than next year. Um, but yeah, so I think with, with other books, it's a question of just, I don't know, translating from brain, brain fog speak to like language on the page. And that can take, that's a lot of work. That's as much uh, a question of like, like pushing more, I don't know if that's even a word. It's a question of you have to put them further or you know burden them with the our decision that we're just really tired of our mess, we're gonna take it off. Um so yeah, I think this is this is definitely a time to be uh thinking even more keenly about the social contract and how we how we make room for each other in public transport. And then you know, I write about this in the 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 afterword, which I wrote like very recently, 
in the midst of the pandemic, like I do kind of miss the crush of bodies, you know, the way that like we didn't have to wear masks and we just like we're smelling each other's smells and like smushed up against each other's flesh. Like um, that was, you know, at the time I was like, oh God, the buzz is ran today. But now it's, you know, I feel a little bit nostalgic. But when it, if and when it happens again, I'll probably reserve the right to hate it. <laughs> I'm very interested in your interest in Perret for one, for many reasons it's interesting, but the fact that, and I don't know the word in English, it's cruciverbiste, the fact that he was playing, he was doing crossword, okay, and he was writing, and he was playing with the words and the, the shape of the, you know, when you juggle between French and English, there is a similarity in my mind happens to me and I guess it happens to you too. And I see a link in the interest you have of Perec and of Canola, more Perec than the others, because there were a bunch of guys, not poets and mathematicians, but sometimes both of them, you know. So did you did, did you see the connection or is it something that that is inside you that you found completely natural that drew you to Perec more than anybody else? What, what do you mean about the crosswords? Because it's a play, it's playing with the words that you do when you switch from language, one language to another. You see, this is what you do. You do vertically and, and horizontally. When you, do it. when you go from French to English, you do the same sort of calisthenics. Yeah. And uh, this is what you do when you do crosswords. So, and Pirac is the only one in the whole group who had that talent and was doing this. Okay, so that's <laughs> why. That's why I always, you know. Yeah. This, uh, yeah. No, I love that question. That's such a creative <laughs> and dynamic way to think about it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I I am very bad at crossword puzzles. Oh, My parents are great at them, um, and I go home and do the Sunday Sunday Times puzzle with them, or you know the weekday puzzle. Like, oh, it's a Monday puzzle. That's why I know so many of the answers. Uh, it's harder <laughs> so we <week> go <laughs> um, But yeah, I think you know, correct more than more than the others. I mean, I, I, I have great fondness for a lot of the other Olympians, though by no means all of them. Some of them are very problematic. Um, he's, sorry, they're, some of them are cuckoo, some of them are misogynist bastards. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, Perec, he's just so lovely. He's got such heart. He's writing, it's it's esoteric, but it's 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 like, it's, life is on the line life is at stake it's it has to do with the way we live it has to do with history and you know genocide and memory and power and and and, and also cats sitting on your shoulder and crossword puzzles it's everything you know life users manual is this epic book that just gets everything in um and so i think i really respond to him because he he, he cares about me even though you know we never met um i guess i was like four or something when he died but uh, you know, he he cared about people, and he cared about the way that we all live together in the world in a way that I find very resonant and and relevant and applicable. Um, and the other Olympians, they do they care about those things, but the projects that they made with them are maybe a bit um, more cerebral. Um, like Jacques Foubault's Great Fire of London is is I'm sure a wonderful book, but my God, it's so long. Like I just don't have time. But like Life for User's Manual is also quite a long book and very demanding, but it just like it, it hooks its it sinks its teeth into life and life doesn't let go. Um, and so I just find him to be a very companionable, thoughtful, wonderful human being. Thank you. That's a great really a great analogy. <laughs> I will say just since we're talking about Unilipo so much, on our event next Tuesday is with two Unilipo members. So oh dear. I'm really, and that's probably, probably not the ones I'm thinking of. <laughs> Thank you so much for the lovely discussion, the questions and the answers. I had a question for you, if I understand correctly, it's the same journey that you did along the same time. So did you notice any regulars that the group worked on at the same time? And did you notice if they didn't come in? The reason I'm specifically is because my mother is in India and she has a bus friend. So <laughs> my bus friend actually looks forward to her coming in. Oh, and, that's uh, so much better than an art monk. 
<laughs> and um, once my mom told me that when she was asked on the next day, her bus ran out for you, was there yesterday? The bus actually waited for you a few more minutes. <laughs> so this is also India, but it's, you, know, you can still run and almost catch it in the nick of time, probably, you know, and then you tell yourself you're all right. I didn't get the bus, stop it. So I don't have to, I told her, I said, I just think this will never happen in France. I don't think people strike up friendships, but I'd like to know if you noticed something different. And if you did, I could go back and tell her it's possible. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that is such a fantastic question. Um, wow, I love that. Your mom's bus friend sounds great. Um, I, I did not make any bus friends, sadly. I think, you know, it's not that it's not possible in Paris, but I think I wasn't there regularly enough. I was only there like two days a week. Um, and I would try to make the 8.12 in the morning, but sometimes I would just miss it and you want to go by. But when I did make the 8.12, um, I would see this mother and her two kids. Um, and I think I mentioned them a couple of times. Um, I'm not sure, but I definitely was noticing them and I might not have been writing about noticing them. And I, I would be happy if I made the 8.12 to see them and happy that they made it too. Because God, it's really hard. <laughs> Those early morning buses. And I thought about them very recently. I was leaving, um, leaving my apartment in London and um, I have to try to get to the elevator before the family down the hall because otherwise they'll take the elevator and then I'll be late. Um, and I was <laughs> thinking, I was like, oh, it's like 8.15. You know, if I were in Paris, I would have missed that 8.12. But it's funny that it's, you know, I have a very different life now and a very different kind of morning um, commute, like walking, pushing a stroller full of my heavy three-year-old son to his school. Um, rather than taking the bus to teach. But but yeah, I, I do think about that mother and her two kids and if they're still on the 12, I hope they're well. Hi, thank you very much for coming tonight. It's very interesting. I um, I wanted to tell you about my brother who writes uh, books in Chicago. He writes about American composers and he's on his fourth book now. And he's always written his books in Starbucks, various Starbucks all around Chicago. And he needs that movement and he's, he's talking in the background and he needs to hear things without really listening to them. And obviously your book would be very different if you had been at home sitting in front of a computer writing. And I was wondering how much you think that that's necessary to, to have some sound uh, activity on the outside, which really uh, you're not paying attention to, but you need it sometimes. Yeah, um, you'll have to tell me uh, more about this. Sorry, did you say it's your son or your brother? brother. Your brother. You have to tell me about that later because my partner is an American composer, <laughs> so I'd like to hear about his book. Um, but yeah, I think you know this book just couldn't have been written anywhere but the bus. Like it's literally about the bus. It's made of the bus. Um, and I do like to work in cafes, and I think that that is hugely important. That kind of, um, I missed that during the pandemic, for instance, when cafes were closed um, or when you couldn't leave the house. Um, that kind of stimulation, it just takes you out of yourself. Um, even if you're tuning it out, there's some kind of plane that your mind moves on when you're in public. And I can only really do a certain kind of writing in cafes. I can revise and I can kind of generate. Um, but there's a, then beyond that, I can't like kind of serious writing. I can't do in a cafe. But yeah, I think that it's it's hugely important. I mean, I was just thinking about that today because I, I traveled from London today on the Eurostar, and so I had all these thoughts that I wouldn't have thought had like just sitting in my house on my couch. Um, and obviously, obviously, you're having different thoughts. But you're, I think, when you're traveling, the something about the movement of your body in space, it's like knocking loose new thoughts or deeper thoughts you know, than the kind of everyday. Um, so I think it's very, very, very important for writers to get out and circulate and, and travel and go places. And I think that's why writers like to go to residencies. Because it's not just about like having a different space to write in or being away from your family, which, you know, those things are good too. But it's about putting yourself in a different space, making your body go to a different place and be a different way. And, and then that does affect the work in such a weird way. We have time for one more question. If there is one. Or we can, uh, I think so. There, I just wanted to say there is, there is one passage that I can't 
quite find on, in here. Um, just very quickly looking for it. Um, but my very dear friend Elizabeth is here, and it's a bus story that she told me. Um, and it was a really nice moment where I can't find how I wrote it, but um, you told me that you you were, I think you were on a bus, or no, you were coming out of your apartment and or something like that, and some guy like dropped a phone and you thought it might have been yours that he'd like been trying to steal it and it like shattered into pieces on the ground. And you you picked it up and you didn't you like run onto a bus and say, Did someone drop a phone or something like that? I might be getting the story kind of I haven't thought about it in a while. So yeah, but like I think Elizabeth got on a bus and said, Does anyone drop a phone? And and the guy was like, Oh, I did. And the bus driver said, Ah, you're in luck. Have that chance. And that was such a nice bus story that I included in the book. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. Um, can we have a final round of applause, please? Amazing uh, questions and, and thoughts, insights. Thank you to Lauren Elkin for taking the train and other forms of public transport <laughs> to get here today. Thank you all to, for coming out. Thank you to everyone on Zoom.